Draco Malfoy and the Truth of the Heart by Draco will hear about this. Chapter 24 Accepting Your Emotions There was a knock on the door to Draco's study. He sighed, lowering his book to his lap and rubbing his temple. Yes, he asked, exasperated. Harry opened the door, smiling at him with a sheepish expression. He was already wearing dress robes. Sorry to disturb you, he said, but you have a visitor. If it's my mother... Draco snapped. You can tell her. It's no use. I won't... It's not your mother, Harry interrupted and calmly. He stepped aside and someone else entered the doorway. Draco's jaw dropped. Victor, he breathed. What? What are you doing here? Supplies, Victor grinned. I'm here to see you. But how? Draco asked, blinking rapidly. Harry and I might have... How do you say conspired behind your back? He chuckled. Harry and Victor exchanged a smirk, and Draco felt like he'd been dropped into an alternate universe. What? He asked stupidly. He sent me a letter. Victor explained. Asked me to come over. So here I am. You did? Draco asked, staring at Harry. Harry shrugged, suddenly seeming embarrassed. I thought you'd appreciate seeing him, was all he offered as an explanation. He always got along so well. It went unsaid that the last time Draco had spent time with Victor, Harry had thrown an epic fit of jealousy. And now he was inviting him into their house, as if none of that had ever happened. Had Draco missed something? The rational part of his brain quickly caught up with what was happening, though. Things had changed drastically since last summer. After all, Draco had been diagnosed with depression, and today the father he refused to associate with was on trial for his crimes against humanity. Harry had probably wanted to do something nice for Driggle, offer him some sort of distraction while Harry was out testifying at his father's trial. So he had bitten the bullet and contacted Victor. Drago cleared his throat, suddenly feeling a bit choked in the face of the gesture. Thank you, he whispered. Harry just smiled at him. You two have a great day catching up, he said, clasping Victor's shoulder in a determinedly cheerful manner. I'll be off to the ministry. Let's have dinner together tonight. That would be great, Victor smiled at him. Harry nodded. With a last smile at Drago, he stepped out of the doorway. Drago heard the sound of his disapparation a moment later. I can't believe you're here, Drago shook his head, putting his book onto his desk and getting to his feet. I'm sorry I haven't been writing much. I Don't worry, Victor shook his head. Harry told me you haven't been feeling well. Drago sighed, shrugging. It was hard to explain in a letter, he muttered. I'm here now, Victor chuckled. I will listen if you want to talk, and if you don't, I can talk. Drago smiled at that. He crossed the distance between them to pull him into a tight, heartfelt hug. When he let go, he suggested, Want to sit outside? The weather is nice today, and Harry and I put up sunscreen charms so I don't burn the coal from each ray of sun. Oh, thank Marvin. Victor laughed. I spent my year in northern Canada, you remember. I need to watch out. Drago laughed, and they moved outside, with a short stop in the kitchen to get them some cold juice. When they were reclining in the lounge chairs Harry and Drago had chosen for the terrace, they started chatting amiably. Victor told them about his team, and about Canada, about home, and about Stoyan and Audrey. When he felt comfortable enough, Drago started talking, too, about what had happened throughout the last year. The way they'd been in hiding for most of the time, and how there had been more than one close call— he told him about the run-in with his father and his aunt. He told him about the final battle, and about Harry walking into his death, stumbling over that part. He told him how he had been feeling detached ever since the war had ended, and how Healer Jones had diagnosed him. All the while, Victor listened, not interrupting, not asking disruptive questions. Drago was grateful for that. When he had run out of words, Victor let out a long, heavy breath. I get why your letters were so short now. He muttered, you can't put this into writing. Maybe you can, Draco allowed. I just wasn't there yet. I understand, Victor nodded. He glanced at him. I'm so sorry you had to go through this, Draco. I got to imagine what it was like. All I know is that you are really, really strong. To survive all of this and keep fighting, even now, you have my respect. I don't feel strong, Draco frowned. You are, Victor shook his head. You just don't see it. Drago didn't answer, and Victor sighed. He took a sip of his drink, then he said, There was almost no information on what was happening in Britain throughout the war. Papers in Canada or Bulgaria wouldn't print anything. I mean, I knew what was happening. 
After all, I had fled from Fleur's wedding myself. I heard that the ministry had fallen, but the press didn't print it. I had no way of knowing what was happening or if you were alive. I couldn't contact you either. I tried writing to Fleur once a couple of months in, but she said she didn't know anything about you and asked me not to write anymore because it was dangerous. He took a deep breath. Then the papers in Canada reported on the Battle of Hogwarts, and information finally leaked out of the country. He only mentioned Arido, so I sent Vukan to you hoping that he wouldn't return with the letter unopened, or with a note from your relatives or Henry telling me that you died at some point, months ago. I'm sorry, Draco sighed. I wish I could have kept you updated, but... Why no, Nectar shook his head. You didn't want to put me in danger, it just... It's up, this all. Draco nodded, and he sent a soft smile at him. Your English has become amazing, by the way, he commented. You mean apart from my pronunciation. Victor rolled his eyes. I'm working on it. Canada is going me good, though. Glad to hear that, Draco smiled. Then after a moment of silence, he asked, How did you get out of the country after the wedding? Victor sighed. It was a mess, he admitted. Still had to take the international port key. And the minister knew I was friends with you, so they stalled and asked me questions. No! Draco muttered, eyes winding. Your king's legal went of it all. Victor shot him a wry smile, contacted my coach via international flu call, who've contacted the Canada Department for International Sports. They got into contact with your ministry, demanding I get sent back immediately. Your ministry gave in. I think they wanted to avoid an international incident, but they made it very clear that I should, uh... Refrain from travel into the UK, if it's not for work. Marlin! Draco breathed, shaking his head. I'm so sorry you had to go through that. Could have been worse. Victor shrugged. Being famous helped. No kidding! Draco nodded, sending him a weak smile. After a moment, he ended. I'm even more sorry for leaving you without news for so long now. Don't worry. Victor shook his head. I knew you had no choice. You know what we're going to do? Draco decided. We're going to charm ourselves on parchments. I have some with Hermione and Harry. They are erasable, and we can use them for quick communication. Much easier than letters. I know it can't make up for the lack of news throughout the war, but... That sounds great. Victor smiled. I'd like to have more regular contact with you. Victor smiled at him, trying to remember which spell Hermione'd used. Maybe he'd better quickly check with her via the parchments, lest he messed it up. Victor spent the rest of the afternoon out in the sun and then went back inside when they became hungry. Draco was fixing them at tempura don. Eureka's moving in gift had been a Japanese recipe book, which she'd chosen after she'd heard from Harry that Draco was actually quite adept at cooking. She'd also been their dealer for ingredients, so Draco had been making his way through the dishes, trying his luck. Harry and Draco had both really taken to the fried vegetables and seafood on rice, though, so he decided to indoctrinate Victor, who'd claimed to be game. When Harry returned from the ministry, he took an exaggerated whiff of air and broke out into a grin. Draco rolled his eyes. Eureka will be so smug that you're so hooked on Japanese food, he commented. Maybe I'm just hooked on your cooking, Harry said innocently. We need to get you more recipes. Italian, Chinese, Spanish, Indian, French. I already know some French dishes, thank you very much, he injected. I can get you Bulgarian and Canadian recipes. Victor Grant, I'm Russian, I'm sure. Oh, please. Harry nodded, eyes sparkling. I'm not your house elf, Draco called, but he was smiling. Then his smile fell and his shoulders tensed. So, he said, clearing his throat, what's the verdict? Harry sighed, green eyes serious as they met his. Three years in Azkaban, he said, though I think his sentence might be reduced to two on grounds of good conduct if he keeps his head down and continues to cooperate. Draco's lips twisted. He dropped another bunch of mushrooms into the oil. He splashed and Victor took a careful step back. Are you okay? Harry asked carefully. Three or two years, Draco muttered. Isn't that a little... I don't know, weak in the face of all that he's done. He was the Dark Lord's right hand for a long time. He joined up with it for a second time. He knew exactly what it was up for. And still they're so lenient. He cooperated. Harry shrugged. He helped the Ministry in hunting down a lot of Death Eaters that were still on the run. He agreed to the manor being searched and stripped of all dark artifacts. He offered up a good amount of money for war reparations. 
So he paid his way out as he always does. Draco rolled his eyes. I think the most decisive factor was that he didn't give me away, though. Harry shrugged. That's probably what swayed the wizard Gamont in his favor. Draco sighed. Whatever, he murmured. He lifted the mushrooms out with his wand, satisfied to see that they were golden brown. How did mother take it? I assume she's going to sit around and wait for him like the good pure blood wife she is? How would I know, Draco? He sighed. I didn't speak to her after the trial. I stayed only long enough to hear the verdict, then I took off to avoid the press. Fair enough, Draco nodded. I don't quite understand her either, Harry sighed. I mean, I tried to. I guess she must have had her reasons for marrying him once upon a time, and those reasons are probably what's keeping her from divorcing him. I guess it comes down to what you can forgive in the name of love. Those words hit Draco in a tender place. For a moment he couldn't breathe. Harry continued. I mean, if I imagine him being you, I like to think I could forgive you a lot, but where is the line? And you forgave your husband for crimes like that, for endangering your son. I'm not sure I could. I mean, it's a moot point, because you'd never... At that moment, oil splashed over and hit Draco right across the palm. He flinched, and Harry's eyes widened. Careful! He called, and he cast a shield charm over the oil before walking over to Draco, examining the wound. I think Hermione left some booba tuber solution. He muttered, summoning it with a flick of his wand. There we go. Hold still. He gently applied the liquid, and Draco tried hard to not pull his hand away. He felt twitchy. He could feel Victor's eyes on him, but the older boy stayed silent. Okay. Harry declared. All done. Why don't you sit with Victor? I'll fry the remaining vegetables. There's only a couple more. Thanks. Draco nodded. He walked over to the dining table, Victor on his heels. When they sat, Victor muttered, You okay? Of course. Draco lied. When did he also you? Victor asked Draco later that evening after they had eaten. Harry had taken over the dishes and told Draco and Victor to go back out to the terrace and sit outside. Draco had poured them a glass of elf wine and they'd settled back into the lounge chairs, watching the sunset at the horizon. Draco looked at Victor in confusion and Victor pointed at Draco's hand. Draco glanced down at the ring. The first time during the war, a couple of days before the final battle, Draco said. Then again on my birthday, with the ring. That's the day he asked me to move in together, too. I see. Victor smiled. I'm glad. Though I always knew you'd end up together. I think you were the first to believe it. Draco smiled. It was obvious. Victor shrugged. Draco just humped. Do you have a date yet? No. Draco shook his head. We want to wait until things are better with our PTSD and my depression. This had been Harry's decision more than Draco's. But Draco was grateful that he had set his foot down. Apparently, Molly Weasley had started planning their wedding as soon as she'd heard of their engagement, and Draco really didn't feel like going through a big ceremony right now. We should wait until we both feel like going there, Harry had told him. Right now, things are a bit hard for both of us, and I don't think we'd have the headspace for it. I know things like PTSD and depression might never go away completely, but there will be better times, and we are in no rush. We can start planning when we both feel better. And he was right, of course. Draco couldn't imagine going through wedding planning right now. Makes sense, Victor said, nodding his head in the chair next to him. Focus on your health, for now. A wedding is stressful. One of my teammates got married last year, and it was a mess, I tell you. You don't need that kind of pressure until you feel stable. Draco nodded, and they fell into a comfortable silence. Finally, Draco asked, a bit hesitant, You are happy with Harry, right? What do you mean? Draco asked, turning to him. I don't know. He shrugged. Just maybe I was imagining it, or it's your depression, but there's some vibe I got from you that worried me. Draco gulped, looking out over the pink sky. I love him, Draco assured him. I'm just dealing with some things right now. It's a bit hard to explain, but I love him. He loves you too, Victor told him. A blind man can see that. He worries about you. I know he does, Draco nodded. Victor said, Well, whatever issues you have, I hope you can work it out. Victor said, You are good together. And if you ever need to talk, I am willing to listen. Thanks, Draco smiled. Then he added, I still need to charm you that parchment. Tomorrow, Victor waved him off. I'm not leaving until after lunch. We have time. Draco nodded and settled back into his chair, watching the sun disappear from sight. You mentioned before that you felt that Harry wasn't being honest when he says that he loves you, he 
Healer Jones told him, her pen tapping absent-mindedly against her clipboard. I'd like you to tell me why you feel that way. Draco gulped. His fingers clenched into a fist as his heartbeat sped up. He was silent for a long moment. I know this isn't an easy thing to answer, Healer Jones allowed. So take your time, and if you feel overwhelmed, we can break this off. Draco nodded. He made a conscious effort to unclench his fingers and take a deep breath. I've always felt a bit on the outside in our circle of friends, Draco admitted. They were all in Gryffindor, and I was in Slytherin. Harry spent more time with them, and when it came down to it, they seemed to listen more to each other than to me. I often felt replaceable. What gave you that feeling? she asked. My opinion was often disregarded, Draco said. They made decisions in my absence, and... His voice got, but he pushed on. In our fourth year, Harry was one of the champions in the Triwizard Tournament. The second task took place in the lake in front of the school. The person he cared about most was taken from him and held hostage by the merpeople. And that person wasn't me. That must have hurt, she said softly. Like hell, he nodded, his voice rough. Weasley, he had abandoned Harry earlier that year because he believed that Harry had been cheating to become champion, and still he chose him over me. Or so it felt. How did you react? I didn't talk to him for weeks. How did you make up? People kept telling me that it wasn't really about me. Draco whispered, that Harry's priorities were the foster family Weasley's family represented, and that's why he was so irreplaceable. I think what really put things into perspective, though, was the third task approaching. I couldn't stay married when he was in danger. I see, she nodded. She was silent for a long moment, then she said, You are a very rational person, Draco, and that's admirable. You are incredibly intelligent, probably one of the most intelligent people I've ever met. I think one of the mistakes you often make, though, is trying to rationalize your own feelings into submission. You told me once before that what you were feeling wasn't rational. Even if you can't understand it, Draco, it doesn't change the fact that you feel it. You shouldn't feel guilty for emotions that you don't perceive as rational. You have to learn to accept your emotions. You did the same thing when you forgave Mr. Potter back then. You did what made sense to you and suppressed the hurt and anger you felt, and now it's all coming to the surface again because the wound never really healed. So what you're saying is that it was a mistake forgiving him? Draco asked, frowning. No. Healer Jones shook her head. Not at all. You did what you thought was right back then, and it might have been at the expense of your own healing process to some extent, I think. Draco frowned, taking that in. Healer Jones watched him. Then she asked, do you think you might have done the same thing on other occasions? Pushed your emotions down to keep the peace between you and Mr. Potter. Constantly, Draco said without thinking. Throughout the year we were in hiding, or... He gulped before adding. After he walked into the forest. That's another thing you haven't forgiven him for, she observed. It's not that I'm angry, Draco shook his head. Aren't you? Heather Jones raised her eyebrows. "'because it would be understandable if you were. "'Don't suppress your emotions, Mr. Malfoy.' "'He took a deep breath, closing his eyes. "'Fine, maybe I'm a little angry,' he admitted. "'But mostly I'm disappointed and hurt.' "'Because he left you behind?' "'Yes. "'It comes back again to you not believing in his love, doesn't it?' "'Exactly!' "'Draco felt his eyes sting. "'He kept them pressed firmly shut by his lip.' It's okay to cry, Mr. Malfoy, Healer John said softly. This is something that hurts you. Crying helps. Draco didn't want to cry, though, so he breathed through it, and the urge passed. He opened his eyes, blinking and focusing his gaze on Healer Jones again. Have you ever tried voicing your emotions in front of Mr. Potter? She asked eventually. Sometimes, Draco shrugged. I don't think he gets it, though. What about your other friends? She asked. You mentioned that you felt excluded by that whole group. Have you ever told them? I told Weasley, Draco snorted. That was easy, though. We never got along. How did he react to that? He basically said I was seeing things. He thought Harry and Hermione were both obsessed with me. 
that might indicate, though, that it's just a matter of perception. He nodded. Have you considered trying to talk to your other friend? Hermione? No, Draco shook his head, and I don't want to. Why? She asked, surprised. She might be able to assuage your fears a little. She might also confirm them, Draco pointed out. I'm not going to poke a sleeping dragon. She regarded him curiously. You seem to be really scared of losing your position in this group, she pointed out. Why is that, do you think? Draco shrugged. I'm not sure, he said. His heart was pounding. She waited, but when no further answer was forthcoming, she continued. You have known these people for seven years. You've gone through hell with them. You were engaged to one of them. And from what I have heard and can divulge, Mr. Potter seems to truly care about you, at least from where I am standing. And yet you seem terrified that with one wrong word, they're going to decide they've had enough of you. But in my experience, this is not how relationships like these work. So it does make me wonder how you have developed this fear. Draco shrugged. His heart was still pounding. I told you, he said, his voice small. I always felt like an outsider. Did you also feel insufficient in some way? She asked. Yes, he said without hesitation. Obviously, my father was a Death Eater. That doesn't reflect on you. Please go back in time and tell 11-year-old Ron Weasley that. So he gave you grief about it? Only constantly. So you felt that because your father was perceived as a bad person, you had to be one too. It's what people thought of me. A self-fulfilling prophecy, so to speak. Maybe. But you didn't turn out like your father. You are the opposite of him, if I might say so, she pointed out. Why do you still feel insufficient? Trigo had no answer to that, so he shrugged again. The silence stretched on between them. Here's what I want you to do until next week, Draco, she said. I'd like you to make a list of all the things you like about yourself. Ten things or more, if you can. Please don't view this as an exercise of narcissism. You have real issues of self-worth and self-confidence, and I'd like to work on those. Maybe if you learn to see the good in yourself, it will be easier for you to believe that Mr. Potter does love you, even if he did make some mistakes along the way. Okay, Draco frowned. What if I don't find him? Then come back with what you have and we'll think of some more together, she said. Don't ask anyone for help, though. This is for you. I don't need to hear what Mr. Potter loves about you as much as I enjoy a good romance. Okay, he nodded, smiling a little. I'll see you next week, Mr. Marfoy, she nodded. Good job today. He didn't feel like he'd done a good job. He just dug up so many things he'd buried deep inside, and now he felt wrung out and confused. But maybe he reflected that was the point of this. You have to learn to accept your emotions, Healer Jones had said. What if you didn't like your emotions, though? What if they didn't add up to the person you wanted or needed to be? We've got letters from Hogwarts. Harry told him when Draco came down the stairs in the morning. He had almost finished setting the table and Draco halted in his steps, staring at the two letters that were ominously sitting next to the pot of tea. Hogwarts, Draco replied. It's probably McGonagall asking whether we want to come back to complete our new year. Harry shrugged. I met her at the ministry a couple of times. She told me to expect mail. Oh, Draco nodded. Harry put down the toast on the table and sat, and Draco took his own seat, staring at the letters as if they would burst into flames. Do you want to go? Draco asked. Harry bit his lip and caught his eyes. Not really, he admitted. Kingsley offered me a position in the Aura trainee program coming August. Both me and Ron, that is. Oh, Draco nodded. He'd expected as much, but it still felt weird hearing it. I said I would speak to you first, though, Harry continued. The place will still be there if I go to Hogwarts with you. So if you want to go and want me to come with you, I will, Drago. Or if you don't, the Ministry will be happy to make an exception for you, too. I'm sure they can fix you up with a position in the Unspeakables trainee program. Drago considered it. Then shook his head. I think I want my notes, he sighed. I enjoy studying, and I can't imagine going to work in only a couple of months. You could also take a break. Harry offered. We don't need the money. Everyone would understand. I think Hogwarts is a good idea for me, he interrupted him. I'll ask Hermione what she plans to do, but even if she's not going, 
Ginny, Ryan, Yoriga, and Luna will be there. I'll be fine. Aries stared at his plate. Then he shook his head. I'll tell Kingsley to wait for a year. He said, then we can... Harry! Draco sighed. Don't! Why not? Harry frowned. Do you really want to go back? Draco asked. Like, really? Harry hesitated. I mean, if you weren't going, I wouldn't consider it. Harry admitted. But I don't want to be apart from you for a whole year. It won't be a whole year, Draco said. It's from September to June with two holidays. And there's always hugs mean weekends. It's still too long. Harry shook his head. We've never been apart for that long. Yeah, well, we've been living in each other's pocket for the past year, let's be honest. Draco sighed. If you look up the word codependency in a dictionary, you might find us as an example. So maybe this isn't the worst thing that could happen to us. Harry looked hurt at that. He was staring at Draco. Do you want to get away from me? He asked sharply. No, Draco sighed. I just... We're supposed to be stronger than this. You want one thing, I want another thing. Even if we end up living apart for a couple of months because of that, we should come out of it all right if we want to make this work. We want to get married and want to make it last. We can't just hold back all the time and follow the other around. It's unhealthy. There. Feel your emotions. Don't hold back to accommodate Harry. Heather Jones would be proud. Harry, though, looked upset. What he said, though, was... I guess that makes sense. His voice was small. They ate the rest of their meal in relative silence. Draco took up the dishes after, and Harry disappeared upstairs for a while. When he came back down, he slipped into his shoes and robes. I'm going out for a while, he said, not looking at Draco. Ministry? he asked. No, Harry asked, hesitating. Then he said, Heather Jones. But our next meeting is Friday, Draco blinked. I know. Harry said, meaning his eyes. Draco's heart dropped when he saw Harry's eyes were red. I asked for a last-minute meeting. Oh, Draco muttered. I'll see you later. Harry breathed and then he was out the door. Draco stared at the spot he disappeared from. He knew Healer Jones offered emergency sessions, but neither of them had ever had to take her up on the offer. Draco stayed in the kitchen for a long time, feeling rooted to the spot and horribly, horribly guilty.